I remember one time opening some material from a major Christian charity, one that runs within the Church of England to help tackle poverty, one that assumed does a lot of good work. But as I read through its annual report, I noticed something was missing. There was no Jesus. He did not receive a single mention anywhere. There's one reference to God, or rather being people being made in God's image, But it's something I noticed there and time and time again. Many Christian services, charities, literature, Jesus is missing. And friends, if you don't have Jesus at the centre of your faith, your Christianity is a hollow sham. It's a fake. I think what happens is this. Instead of being a saviour, Jesus is downgraded to be an inspirer. He inspires us to seek justice, to help the poor. He inspires us to protect family values or look after the environment. And it's all good things, but they're not the heart of the matter. If Jesus comes basically to inspire people, well, you might find him inspirational, but for someone else it's Gandhi or it's a sense of fair play. Or Jesus is a good inspirer for some people, but you may have different options. And so he becomes optional. Look, Jesus does inspire, no doubt about that. But the heart of our faith is that he is saviour. The gospel is a rescue story. People are in trouble and we need to be saved. Well, Psalm 53 ends with a cry for salvation. Verse 6, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. Why do we need a saviour? Well, Psalm 53 tells us why. It tells us that the whole of humanity, every man, woman and child, stands under the verdict guilty because of our sin. Let's look in the psalm. Verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Well, it doesn't look like this is a verse about everyone, but it goes on. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There's no one who does good. These verses are quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3. As he writes to convince uh, the the people he's writing to that everybody needs a saviour. But can it really be true that Everyone goes around saying there's no God. There has been a rise in atheism in the last 50 years, but across history, very, very few people are are actual atheists. But what David's doing here is expressing very starkly something that's true of all of us. Now, it might be that he wrote this psalm after a particularly striking example of a big fool. A lot of these psalms in the 50s are from David's life, particularly the years when he's on the run from Saul. And in 1 Samuel 25, there's a story about David and a man called Nabal. And Nabal, Nabal, is probably a nickname given to him after he died because Nabal, Nabal means fool. Nabal was a fool. But perhaps David saw in this fool something that's true of all of us to a lesser or greater degree. A desire to live without God. Verse 1 literally says, the fool says in his heart, no God. This isn't a philosophy statement. I've thought long and hard and I've decided... I don't believe in a God. It's not that sort of just statement. It's a statement saying, I'd rather live life, no God. So every single person who goes around their daily business as if God is not directly involved is saying, no God. When you make a big spending decision, buying a car, choosing a holiday, and you don't try to make that decision within the context of God's commandments about money, you're living as a practical atheist. And God says, 
You fool. There is no one who does good. Again, on, on, a, on a purely human level, of course there are people who do good to one another. But what does life mean on a purely human level? We're already cutting God out of the picture. To say on a purely human level is to, is to say this isn't God's universe, but it is. We are God's creation. What does God define as good? Jesus was asked the greatest commandment. He replied, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength and with all your soul. Hands up who's done that. None of us. So every single one of us has broken the most important commandment. Which means every single one of us is corrupt. And that's the word used. It's there in verse 1. It's again in verse 3. Let me give an example. Imagine a bottle of nice spring water. And I open, take the top off. And I pour in a few grams of some sort of deadly poison. And then I hand it to you and say, there you go, have a drink. Go on, it says at least 99.9% .9 pure. I'm sure it's great. Would you drink it? I don't think so. If it's 99.9% .9 pure water, does that mean it's 99.9% .9 good? No, it's 100% it's unsafe. It's 100% corrupted. And that is humanity. Humanity is corrupt. Not that we do 100% wrong all the time. It's that all that we do is corrupted by sin. None of us has obeyed the most important command. Well, what's the result of this corruption? There are three results, three consequences seen in verses four and five. These are not necessarily the consequence for every single individual, but in a world where we're all sinners, this is what we see. So first of all, we see that the church of God is attacked. Verse four, do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They, ne they never call on God. You see, if sin is, um, no God, thank you very much. It's no surprise that as the church says, yes, there is a God, that others want to silence church. Uh, just by the way, I'm not saying that the world's divided into sinners and church. It's rather all of sins. Church is those who found a saviour, or rather saviours found them. In the Roman Empire, Christians were opposed because they said there's only one God. In pagan Europe, Christians were opposed because they said, don't worship nature, worship the creator. Today, Christians are often opposed because we say, what God commands is more important than what you feel. It's normal for God's people to be opposed by those who want no God. Second, there is unnecessary dread. Verse 5, but there they are, overwhelmed with dread, when there was nothing to dread. You see, without God, worries, fear, dread comes in. It just doesn't need to be there. Let's take an example a lack of meaning. Without God, what's the world all about? What, what am I all about? Do I have something to live for that, that makes sense, that's meaningful? Without God, what am I? Am I a package for selfish genes to rip, replicate themselves? Am I an accident of evolution? 
a small smudge of organic matter on an unremarkable lump of rock orbiting an unremarkable star. And lots of people, maybe particularly younger adults, can struggle with not knowing a big story, a big purpose in life. For some, it's a real dread, a question that occupies all their thinking. For the majority, just there in the background, driving them to find meaning in work or relationships or entertainment, but with a suspicion that these things are empty, ultimately. If they knew the living God, if they knew Jesus, the dread would be gone. He gives such meaning such purpose, such dignity. But once the human heart says no God, and once culture says no God, we get a necessary dread. And then third, the third consequence, there's final judgment. Second half of verse five, God scattered the bones of those who attacked you. You put them to shame for God despised them. Well, who is you here? Arguably, you means King David, frequently attacked and frequently defended by God. But of course, David points to Jesus. So maybe more profoundly, you is Jesus Christ. Sin is rebellion against Jesus Christ and God the Father's anger against sin comes from his love for his son. If, if you attack my wife, you and I are enemies. If you attack my daughter, I have serious problems with you. Well, when Jesus Christ is attacked, when his rule as Lord of heaven and earth is challenged, God the Father, who loves his son, is rightly angered. There's no future when God is opposed, when Christ is opposed. Sin calls out the judgment of God. And we, we talk about the need of a saviour. We need to be saved from sin because sin brings the anger of God into the world. And none of us can stand against that. So what have we seen so far? Sin is the no God attitude in our hearts and minds, in our countries, in our cultures. All of us are corrupted by sin. There's no one who does good, good not in any ultimate way. And as sin takes hold, we see that the church is attacked. There's unnecessary dread, this final judgment. But then verse six comes in at the end and we rejoice in verse six. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. We don't need inspiration to come out of Zion, out of the heavenly city of God. We need salvation to come out of Zion. I hope you know that the name Jesus means the Lord saves. So we can read verse 6 as... Oh, salvation has come out of Zion, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is saviour, because he's the answer, he's the solution. He's the answer to sin. We looked at Psalm 51 a few weeks ago. Sin is a stain that needs cleansing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin, bringing forgiveness. Jesus is the saviour, he's the answer to judgment. See, when God judges the world, he pronounces his no against all that is wrong and evil. And in Romans chapter three, Paul uses this psalm to say that God's no is against all of us. There's no one righteous, not even one. And so the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. But God sends Jesus. 
in love on the cross. The divine wrath is poured out on Jesus Christ. He takes the penalty for sin. Then in the resurrection, God says his yes to Jesus. Jesus is declared to be perfect, righteous, sinless. And so if you come to Jesus, God's yes to Jesus becomes his yes to you. The righteousness of Jesus covers over your sin. In and through Jesus, you can hear God's yes being spoken to you now. And if he speaks his yes to you in Christ, he will speak his yes to you in Christ on the day of judgment. In Jesus, we are declared no longer guilty, but righteous, justified. So when God comes to judge the living and the dead, we can stand clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's the answer to judgment. He's the answer to unnecessary dread. He's the, he's the answer to a fearful lack of meaning. The whole universe, all of history, finds its meaning in Jesus, the eternal word of God. Jesus is the answer to the fear of death, for he has overcome death. In Jesus, the resurrection is true, it's real. So everyone who turns to Christ, who calls on the name of the Lord, can know that their resurrection is certain. He is the answer. Jesus is the answer to attacks on the church. All through the world, all through history, people attack the church of Christ. But when Jesus returns, he will vindicate his people. He will say, these people despised by the world, they belong to me. Come into my inheritance, enter into my joy, you who are blessed. Jesus is saviour in so many ways. Far more than, than inspirer, he is saviour. He has come out of Zion to save to rescue, to deliver. And so let me end with this. Jesus is the answer to foolishness. The fool says in his heart, no God. But when we see Jesus, when our eyes are opened by the spirit of life, so that by faith we behold Jesus Christ in his saving power and love, then no God loses all its appeal. Who wants a no God world? Well, a no God world appeals to selfishness, to pride, to corruption. But a no God world is formless and empty. It's bleak. It's pointless. But if Jesus is God saving us. Then we can look at him and see life and beauty, justice and mercy, compassion and kindness, truth and grace. The foolish heart says, no God. The renewed heart says, that's God. He's amazing. Let's pray. Oh, Father, the Lord Jesus is such a saviour. I pray that you'd help our minds to understand the, the scope of his salvation so that the foolish no God attitude is crushed in our hearts. We, we want to say no to that no God attitude because it's foolish and empty. May our eyes behold Christ, your beauty made flesh. May we say yes, God, for in Christ, God, you've said yes to us. You've sent a saviour. May our faith in him drive out all sin.
until the day he returns and we see him face to face. Amen.